As a member of several online speaker building communities, one of the most common questions we're asked is, will these drivers work together? Today, I wanna to try to do my best to help answer any questions you've got surrounding the topic of driver selection. Speaker design is a really complex topic with a lot of subjects to understand, so today we're going to stick to the basics. Some of the topics we're going to cover include enclosure size, frequency response, impedance, and sensitivity. Topics you'll need to understand before designing your own speaker that won't be covered in this video include acoustical and electrical measurements, as well as crossover design. I'm gonna leave a few links down below where you can learn more about these subjects. As a side note, manufacturers like Dayton and others graciously provide FRD and ZMA files along with their drivers, but it's important to understand that these cannot be used to design a speaker. The only reliable way to design a loudspeaker is with a calibrated microphone and an impedance measurement device. These files can be helpful for learning or experimenting, but it's important to understand that they will not transfer to real-world results. That's what makes understanding driver selection so important. Before making any decisions, be sure to watch this entire video as many of these topics are interrelated and and everything's going to need to work well together to result in a speaker that you're proud of and can enjoy. There'll be a lot of generalizing in this video, so any experts watching, please feel free to leave context down below, and likewise, any beginners, please feel free to ask questions. Before we begin, if you're interested in DIY speaker building, you're already in the right place because DIY speaker building is all we do on this channel. I've got a really cool high-end home theater build coming out soon, so go ahead and subscribe if you don't want to miss that. The first topic I want to cover is woofer selection, as this is very crucial. Woofers are going to determine a lot about your finished speaker. This is because the woofer is going to require the most airspace to operate, and it's generally going to be the largest driver that you're using, which means it's going to determine the minimum baffle size. How do you know how big of an enclosure you'll need for your woofer or woofers? Well, there's no shortage of oversimplified ways to guess, but the only reliable way is to use software to model the response. Today, there's free software like WinISD available to help simulate drivers in different enclosures. This will take all of the guesswork out of the enclosure design process. There are many how-to guides on YouTube that I'll link down below. When choosing a woofer, you'll need to have design goals in mind. How loud do you want to play? How low do you want the bass to extend? How high do you expect to cross the mid to your woofer or tweeter? There are drivers designed to excel at one thing like deep bass, low distortion, high efficiency, and there are drivers designed to do all of these things as best they can. Let's take a look at an example of a woofer that can get very loud with very little power. These types of woofers are broadly referred to as Pro or PA woofers. This is the Dayton Audio 12 inch 8 ohm neodymium mid bass woofer. Let's scroll down to the specs and take a look at a couple things. Sensitivity, which we'll cover in just a bit, is 96 dB. This is very high, which means this driver will play quite loud with very little power, which is also a benefit for dynamics. All of this sounds great so far, right? Well, let's keep scrolling a bit and we'll find Parts Express recommended volume. We can see that this driver needs a cubic foot of airspace, but will only play to an F3 of 77 Hertz. So what gives? Well, with pro drivers, you'll usually find that the excursion is quite low. In this case, we've only got 6.75 millimeters of X max. In order to get a pro driver to play low, you'll generally need a very large enclosure, usually much larger than what would be desired for a conventional hi-fi speaker. So is this a bad woofer? Well, no. What this instead means is that this woofer is better suited to applications where power is at a premium and high SPL is needed. Drivers like this are great for live sound and home theater, where the mains aren't responsible for producing the deep bass. Instead, the mains can excel at their own strong suits and simply cross to a subwoofer whose job is to produce the deep low bass. So if you're designing a full range hi-fi speaker, pro drivers are not likely to be the best bet, with the exception of the use of DSP. So next, let's take a look at a driver that's very different. This is the Epic 5.5. This is a really popular driver in the hi-fi community right now. Let's scroll down and take a look at the specs. Right away, the 5.5 inch diameter helps this fit into many more conventionally sized baffles. First, let's take a look at the sensitivity. We see that it's 83 dB, which is 13 dB lower than our Pro Woofer. We'll get more into why this matters in just a bit. Next, let's take a look at the recommended volume again. And we can see that this little woofer will play down to 43 hertz in just 0.2 cubic feet. That would make this driver a great candidate for a full range compact hi-fi speaker. The difference here is that we'll need a lot more power to get this to play at the same SPL as the Pro Woofer we looked at. I've shown you two very different woofers to help make a point. There are a number of ways to optimize a woofer's performance, and reading the TS parameters alone won't tell you very much. It's always necessary to use software to model the response to be sure you're getting the right size enclosure, base extension, and SPL capability. The SPL capability leads into the next topic of sensitivity. 
Driver sensitivity is a rating that helps us understand how loud the driver will play with a given amount of power. For the purpose of driver selection, it becomes important when matching multiple drivers. If we take the example of our Pro Woofer with a sensitivity of 96 dB and try to mate it with this peerless 1 inch Silk Dome conventional hi fi tweeter with a sensitivity of 91 dB, we would have a problem. The woofer would be playing 5 dB louder than our tweeter. The only way to fix this would be to pad the woofer down significantly to bring it in line with our tweeter. While it is sometimes necessary to pad woofers, it's generally best practice to approach this the opposite way. When we start with our woofer, we can establish the lowest sensitivity and make this our baseline. From here, we can select a tweeter or mid and tweeter with a higher sensitivity. This added sensitivity leaves us room in the future to shape the mid and tweeter's response and then pad them down to our woofer's average sensitivity. This will give us the most flexibility for the complex and tricky stage of crossover design. Let's look at our second Hi-Fi woofer example again, and this time we add another woofer in parallel. Doing this will half our impedance and increase the efficiency by 3 dB. Sensitivity and efficiency are not the same thing, but for this purpose we can see that adding the second woofer in parallel gives us 3 dB more output with the two woofers acting as one. It'll be helpful to do some reading on the subject of sensitivity and efficiency as they're often conflated online, so I'll leave a link to some info down below. In short, we can use the parallel driver configuration to our advantage when working with inefficient drivers. Doing this will give a traditional inefficient hi-fi speaker greater dynamics. One of the more common questions about driver selection often revolves around driver impedance. Driver manufacturers will offer an impedance rating often in the 4, 8, 16 ohm region. This is what is referred to as the nominal impedance. Because this rating is nominal, it doesn't tell the whole story. In fact, it's only a snapshot. In reality, drivers are what is called a dynamic load. This means that impedance changes with frequency. Let's take a look at the impedance of this Dayton Audio 6.5 inch classic woofer. We can see that Dayton has rated the driver nominally at 4 ohms. However, when we take a look at the impedance chart, we can see that this varies wildly. The first thing that stands out is the large peak around 35 Hz. This is the driver's resonant frequency. We can see that the peak reaches up to 65 ohms before falling and then trailing back up to around 10 ohms around 1000 Hz, which is the top of the suggested usable range before cone breakup. The mechanical and electrical parameters influence the impedance of a driver, so the curve will look different for every driver out there. For woofers and mid-range drivers, the enclosure will also change the final impedance of the driver. If we take a common question like, can I use a 4 ohm woofer with a 4 ohm tweeter? The answer is likely yes. The use of passive components for filtering will likely raise the impedance. For multiple drivers in parallel, the higher impedance ratings can be helpful, or for grouping large numbers of drivers in an array, like in ProSound. Another common question is whether it's possible to mix driver impedances, and the answer is yes. There is no concrete way to say you can't mate any number of different impedance drivers. Your speaker's final impedance will ultimately be determined by the driver's natural impedance and the crossover implementation, along with the use of things like Zobel networks. The final and equally important topic in driver selection will come down to a speaker's acoustic performance. This is a complex topic, but there are a few things we can focus on to help make better driver selections. Much like we discussed with the woofer selection, most drivers are designed to excel in one particular range. Let's take an example where we've got an 18 inch woofer and a one inch soft dome tweeter. This is an unlikely combo, but it should help to illustrate the point. Let's look at the frequency response of the 18 inch woofer first. We can see that it has a fairly smooth on axis response up to around 2000 Hertz. So we should be fine to cross to our tweeter around 1.5 or so, right? Well, not so fast. What's equally important is the off-axis divergence. This is what is referred to as the dispersion pattern. Let's look at our frequency response again, and this time, let's take a look at the other lines. These other lines are our off-axis responses. We can think of these as what we hear when standing off to the side or above the speaker. Now we can see that these actually start to diverge around the 500 Hz region. This means we will actually want to begin crossing over in this range. You may wonder, if I only plan to sit on axis when listening, why should I care about what happens off axis? Well, the reason is that we don't simply hear the on axis response. What we hear when listening is referred to as the in room response. This is a combination of the on axis with the off axis reflected sound. Let's say that we crossed over around 2000 Hz with our larger woofer. Our on axis would be linear, but our off axis response would have a large dip starting around 500 Hz. When this uneven response is reflected back to us, it will have a negative effect on the overall sound. We can use this line of thinking to apply to all of our drivers. 
Let's say we're going to design a three-way with an 18-inch woofer. We would then want to cross our woofer over no higher than 500 hertz. The same could then be said about our mid-range driver. We would want to cross our mid-range driver over to our tweeter before the mid-range began to diverge. This would ensure that we had the most consistent on and off axis response through the entire frequency range. Often a manufacturer will only provide a single on axis response of their driver, so how do we know where the responses diverge then? Well, luckily this is all determined by physics. While in the real world, each driver will vary slightly, we know that a driver starts beaming, meaning the off axis starts diverging, when the wavelength is equal to the radiating surface of the cone. We can easily find the corresponding wavelength to frequency by using charts and base our decision there. Keep in mind that the radiating surface of a driver is not always the quoted cone area, so this is not an exact way of determining where to cross over, only to get in the ballpark. The real off-axis response will be heavily influenced by the baffle and can only be determined by measuring on that particular baffle. It's not enough that our drivers will play up to a given range. Crossover slopes are not hard brick walls, but rather slopes. When deciding on whether our drivers can be used together, the general rule of thumb is that we want two octaves of overlap. This overlap will leave enough room to shape the responses in a way that sums well for smooth integration. The last and also important thing to understand is distortion. Now, unfortunately, you'll be hard pressed to find published distortion measurements from manufacturers. For mid-range and woofers, we are often forced to use them around their resonant frequency. However, for our tweeter, this becomes very important. We're especially sensitive to distortion in the range of most tweeters, so we'll want to be sure that we eliminate as much as possible. Tweeters have very little excursion, so when playing near their FS, they can introduce a lot of distortion. To avoid this, it's a good rule of thumb to start with crossing over at double the FS with a minimum of second order 12 dB per octave. If you're wanting to cross over lower to meet the mid or woofer's dispersion pattern, you can cross lower than this, but it's highly advised to use higher order filters, third order, 18 dB per octave or more. I hope this video has helped answer some of your questions and covered some topics that aren't already extensively covered. If you found this video helpful, consider subscribing and hitting the thumbs up so that more people just like you can find this video. Thanks, and I'll see you in the next one.